Hello and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, we are retouching another <laughs> very near and dear subject of my heart, which is open banking. And to discuss this, I have Steve Bombs, the Executive Director of the Financial Data and Technology Association, or affectionately known as FData. And I brought him on to talk about the work that they do, which is basically working as a trade association to lobby on behalf of technology companies who want to see open banking come about. And with that, here's my interview with Steve. Steve, thanks for taking the time today. It's my pleasure, Jason. Appreciate the invitation. My pleasure. So, Steve, conversation has happened many times on this podcast, near and dear to my heart, because I want to see it happen. <laughs> Frustrating at many times, too. But tell us about FData and its role in the open banking sphere. Yeah, happy to do it, Jason. So, look, hopefully this is the last conversation you ever have about this, because after this, everything comes to fruition and the world is if a better place. Only. It's all rainbows and unicorns from here on out. So, look, FData is a global trade association. It started back in 2013, 2014 in the UK, back when the UK was starting its open banking journey. It actually was started at the request of the UK Treasury, who approached about six fintech CEOs and said an all-too-familiar story. Like We get the bank point of view very easily and very often. When we're trying to get the fintech point of view on these things, first of all, we have to find you all, and that's tough. And second of all, you all have different perspectives. So it would behoove you to get together and formalize and coordinate on what you think about all of this stuff. And the deal we'll make you is if you do that, we'll give you the same footing in these conversations we give the banks. And so that was where FData was formed. So fast forward to 2016, when open banking begins to become reality in the UK, FData was a convener of two of the three working groups in the open banking implementation entity and really helped it come to fruition in Europe. And of course, now we're global. We have chapters across the globe, including here in North America. So interesting origin story. I don't think I've ever heard one where it's basically like, can you guys just get together and actually like represent yourself properly to us? So I'm glad that happened. And of course, you know, as the open banking leader that the UK has been, I'm glad, you know, no surprise where it came from. Tell me about your role in your organization. How did that come to be? Yeah, so I've been involved in financial services policy for a long time. I was at a large financial institution running their policy for a little bit uh, and then went to the fintech sector. I was working with uh, an aggregator called Yodley for a little while. Oh, wow. Really? No kidding. So that would be and, the biggest guest of the show, but go on. Yeah. And so about five years or so ago, kind of spun off, started to do my own thing, working with a whole bunch of different fintechs on policy issues. And I'd been active in FData as part of Yodley in the European context. And several of us were looking at the North American continent back in 2017 or so. And there were a number of interesting parallels, right? First and foremost, fintech tools were being used. Consumers and small businesses were using them. Second of all, policymakers were starting to focus on those tools, both the benefits, but also the potential risks to consumers. And third, the marketplace had become rife with competitive pressure. And it was getting harder and harder for access to that data with the customer's permission to be guaranteed. And so given those similarities, we launched the North American chapter with just four companies back in 2017, and now we're about three dozen or so. So you're on the side of right in this fight, thankfully. I mean, for anyone who wants to hear more about open banking, I did that five-part series at the beginning of 2021. Uh, it's definitely worth going to listen to. You might come away with it a little bit despondent at the prospect, but uh, these are the guys fighting, leading the charge on, on this side. So basically, the great thing about what you've done is that you guys have seen open banking initiatives, as you told me, on every continent except South, except for except for what, Antarctica? Is that right? For now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, so some banks stopping that from happening on Antarctica. Jo joking, of course, there's no base there. <laughs> the one place we don't have to worry about this. But I think it was it's a great opportunity for us to chat about open banking around the world, what's worked, where there's been kind of setbacks, and kind of learn from experience. I think that's that's really the kind of framing for this conversation I want to have. So before we get started, though, for those new to the subject, can you define open banking simply in your terms? Yes, happy to. So open banking is the digitization of financial services. It's a free and competitive marketplace for you as a consumer, you as an SME, to decide which service provider you want to provide you with the product or financial service. That service provider can be a bank or it can be a non-bank. But essentially, the core part of this is you have the right to take your financial data from point A to that service provider. And point A can be a bank that holds that data about you. It can be a fintech that holds that data about you. The, the open banking ecosystem is agnostic, but you should have the legal right to do that. And then as a result of being able to take that data and make it portable, getting the product or benefit of your choosing. And I've got a great kind of visual metaphor for you, Jason, which you may or may not have heard before, but it's akin to electricity. 
in our view, right? Like everyone has, or most people have electricity in their home. You never think about it. It's there. There's plugs in your house and you primarily care about a handful of things. First and foremost, you care that it works and that it's usable. Second, you care that all the products that you plug in to the outlet are safe and that someone's checked to make sure that you're not going to explode when you plug it in. And third, you care that it's standardized, right? Like you want the same type of plug that uses the same voltage and the same amperage, regardless of what appliance you're using. That's it. You don't have to understand the mechanics of how that electricity is traveling from the power plant through the transformer into your house. You want to understand those three things. That's how we think about open banking. Give the consumer a technological means of taking that data from point A to point B. They don't have to understand the full mechanics of it, but certainly they can if they want to. They need to know what happens if something goes wrong and how to get that corrected. And there needs to be oversight such that regardless of who you're using to deliver that product or service, there's supervision and there's safety assured. So a longer answer maybe than you were hoping for. Fair enough. And you know, I've had this rant on several occasions similar to explaining it, but I think sometimes what people lose in this mix is, well, why is that important, right? Like, why is it important that my data be portable? I mean, I don't understand. I just open up another account somewhere. Can you kind of like frame what the advantage to having your data be portable is to the actual average consumer? Yeah. So think about any, we call it a use case in our world, right? But think about any application in the financial services regime. There are some that are very familiar to folks like Mogo or Questrade or Betterment, or there are some that are smaller. The one thing that they all depend on is the ability to connect back to the data that another entity holds about you. So you could, for example, in theory, I suppose, like you could open up a PayPal account to pick on one fintech by mailing in paper versions of your bank account statement so that PayPal could then verify, here's where the money is coming from and going to when you transact on our platform. But in practice, no one's going to do that, right? Like the number of people who will adopt that use case by printing out statements and mailing it in is tiny. Most people won't even take the time to fill out a full survey, right? You know, the more friction you introduce to a process, the less yeah. likely it's completed, right? So take that use case example for PayPal and expand it across the entire spectrum of financial services. So think about savings. You want to open up an automated savings account that will automatically, for example, round up every time you make a transaction to the nearest dollar. Well, you could mail in that statement that says, here's the bank account that I'm using to transact, take the savings from here. Or in less than 15 seconds, you could just connect it seamlessly. You have the app on your phone. You can manage it from your phone from that point forward. So this is really all about competition in our view. And it's all about a more inclusive, more accessible financial services system that meets you as the consumer SME where you are, rather than it being dictated to you by a large financial institution. Yeah, I think if anyone, I'll point to a particular point of pain. If anyone's ever tried to open up a business banking account and, and get a lending facility with a new bank that they haven't dealt with before, good luck to you, right? Like I've literally had bankers turn to me and say, well, we don't have a relationship with you, so we know we can lend to you. And I'm like, I will log in to my current bank in front of you and pull down the statements and hand you every transaction for as far back as it goes. And you will be able to see all the inflows and outflows verified. And you can base it on that. No, we can't do that. We don't have a system for that, right? I mean, this is traditionally, everywhere lies in the financial system, relies on the data they've collected on you themselves, as opposed to the data that is technically yours. I mean, depending on what country we're in, right? I mean, different countries have different rights to data. Canada, where I'm sitting, we we definitively have one under PEPIDA, but the the, the, yeah. the way in which you, you access it is up for debate. <laughs> and this is what opens up. But in general, like there is, the reality is, is that financial institutions make decisions based off of the data they have on you. And if that data can be portable and dependable, then that allows them to make faster, better, more beneficial decisions for you, right, in the end. Yeah, and look, there's an interesting question embedded in that, Jason, about ownership versus access, right? Like, is there's this ongoing debate in a number of countries that are in the evolution of their open banking conversation about do we bestow an ownership right on the consumer of, over this data, or are we really just talking about getting them access to it? And I'll tell you, like from an FData perspective, we're somewhat agnostic on that point because the practical implications for fintech use cases are really one and the same. But you're exactly right. I mean, it's not just about what is the value that the institution that you're working with sees in you or what, what opportunities they present to you based on that data. It's really about what is the opportunity for you to go out to the private marketplace and mm -hmm. find other opportunities that maybe your financial institution doesn't offer to you. Very so true. like, take this to the extreme. So 
think about insurance, right? Think about retirement. Think about brokerage accounts. It's not just core banking services. It's every financial interaction you have with any company. There is no reason why you should not derive more value from your own data in that. And I'll give you a great example of this that's live in many different markets, including a little bit in Canada and quite a bit in the US. Cash flow underwriting. Think about, as the most extreme example, a relatively new immigrant to a country who has a wealth of credit worthiness in their home country, but they move to this new country, it's a different system. And all yeah. of a sudden, even though they've got 30, 40 years of being a very credit worthy borrower, they've got no credit history here, right? And so they go to apply for a loan and either their FICO score is incredibly low or their credit history is so short that a traditional financial institution just will not give them a loan. Well, if you are an underwriter who can get access to their transaction data from a year, two years, five years, whatever you can get access to, you can see on the first of the month, every month, they paid the same amount to the same vendor. So that was either rent or that was a mortgage payment, right? You could see for 36 months straight on the 15th of each month, they paid a financial institution and then it ended. That's more than likely a three-year loan of some sort, maybe for a car or something like that. They paid their utilities on time for every month of the five. You can begin to build a credit profile for this person. And that is then transcending this old, outdated credit bureau system that is not providing access for that person. But it does that credit system is not reflective of their actual credit worthiness, right? And so that's one example of how access to this data can be life-changing and how the technology is there today to do this. There are companies that are doing this today, including one of our members in North America. But the inability to get access to that data, if you can't connect, in this case, the bank that the, that person had in their old country to the underwriting use case that they want to use in a new country, then you are artificially stopping them from improving their financial well-being. 100%. And even in cases where you are well, well enough off or have a good enough job to get access to certain facilities, other ones are off, off limits, right? So for example, I have a client of mine who went to go to work in the States, very, very top level position, like making great money. And they basically went and said, okay, we want to buy a house and we want to get a credit card. And they're like, oh, well, we can... Totally. I mean, if you buy a, if you want to buy a house, get the deposit, we can totally get you a mortgage, but credit card, we're not going to be able to do that. Right. And it's like, you would think like, so let me get this straight. You can give me hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a house, of course, because it's secured, but you won't extend me a credit card for five grand. And it's because again, they're walking out the street with no history, even though, and again, part of the mortgage is just simply because they're, they can confirm the job, they can confirm the income, but there's no, we don't have a history on you with unsecured debt. So we don't know how things are going to go. It's yeah. pretty farcical when you, if I was to tell you the position this person occupied, it's pretty hilarious to think a bank wouldn't give them a credit card, but it is what it is. So it's, you know, when you think about the credit bureaus are a perfect example, because in theory, with some countries, you can port that from one country to another, but in practice, good luck to you. That is very difficult. So all right, fair enough. Let's talk about how this has been applied around the world. Okay. So what do you think? You know, I'm not sure if you can if you can oh how openly you can speak about this, but some of the better implementations in uh, that you've seen around the world in terms of how open banking has been adopted. So look, this is a an uncomfortable answer for some, but I'll yeah. be honest. Like there, there's two ways that this can happen, right? And we yes. talked a little bit about this before. The first way is the market just says, okay, we're doing this, right? And you've got some early adopters primarily in the financial institution world, the incumbents who say there is value to us moving forward on this. And they drag the rest of the market with them because nobody wants to be the last man standing, right? So that's one option. The second option is that government looks at this and says, there is a real need for a more innovative, inclusive financial ecosystem. And mar the market is not delivering this fast enough or at all. And so we are going to require it. We're going to mandate it. And so by this date, there will begin this transition period by which consumers have this right, small businesses have this right. And we've seen both approaches contemplated globally. The one that works the best by far is the latter, the one where the government says, you're doing this, data holders, right? And third parties, you will have regulatory oversight by this point forward, and here's how this will look. At the end of the day, the market has a bunch of different concerns, right? Financial access is one of them. But shareholder value is another, right? Competitive pressure is another. In theory, government really only has one concern, which is what is in the best, what is the best case for our constituents and for our economy more broadly. And so our view as FDA is the best outcome is where government says, here are the rules of the road. 
right? We'll have input from stakeholders, but by this date, the data belongs to the end user, or at least have the right to access it. And data holders are obligated to make that data available to third parties, for, so long as the consumer has given their consent and the third party has effective oversight. So that's how we see this moving. And you look at like the UK, that's how it worked in the UK, right? In Brazil, that's how the path is going in Brazil. In Mexico, as we speak right now, the Mexican Central Bank and other regulators are working to finalize implementation of the so-called FinTech law, which does exactly what we're talking about. In Canada, there was, as I think you covered, <laughs> there was this advisory committee report that came out earlier this year. It basically said this, right? It said, this is not a competitive ecosystem for financial institutions, for, uh, for consumers yeah, because of financial institutions. Mm -hmm. So government needs to do this. And then the last data point I'll, I'll give you, Jason, is we had the president of the United States earlier this year put out an executive order on competition. And this was one of the things he called out. He said, even in the US where you have 10,000 financial institutions and thousands of fintechs, there is still not enough competition. And we're not meeting the promise of just how innovative and competitive this marketplace could be. We need to have open banking and the government will have to mandate it. So that's the best practice in our view. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because the end of the day, the good thing about government regulation, if it's if it's wise enough, is that it can impose a level playing field and set standards like that. Whereas left to its own devices, the marketplace to come up with its own protocols, it's no one wants a Betamax versus VHS versus God knows what else competition in terms of in terms of standards, right? At the end of the day, you know, if the government can basically say, here's here's the minimum level of a threshold for what is accessibility, and here's how to go about it and what you have to do everybody's on that playing field. And like you said, it's power, it's electricity, right? It's the ability to plug in and not worry that I have the right kind of outlet when I plug in a plug that looks the same. And no one other than government can impose that. I think that's right. And look, a lot of this conversation on open banking correctly is focused on the standard, right? Like what is the technology that we will use to make this work? But I think a focus just on the standard misses the broader point. So I'll keep making terrible analogies just because it's easier to, to visualize. So you know, you'll know, you hear a lot of conversation around, for example, the industry, a different industry, but did this around the Bluetooth standard you know, years ago. You know, It's interoperable, different devices can talk to different devices and it works. But at the rate that, that some markets are going in the absence of government setting the policy rules for how this works, to take that analogy further, you, you could have a scenario where your iPhone tells you like, oh, I'm sorry, this artist is not supported on Bluetooth. You cannot play this song, right? Or you want to use this app on Bluetooth, but this app is not on the approved list. And so you can't use Spotify over this Bluetooth device. That's not the right answer, right? Let You can let industry figure out the standard and the technology to make it work. But only once there has been a legally binding government decree that says, this data belongs to the end user. These are the protections that are in place if something goes wrong. And this is how a third party that's not a bank gets approved to play in this sandbox. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you another analogy, right? A perfect Please. example right now is the home automation world. Pre this recent consortium where Apple, Google, and Amazon and a couple other players got together and said, okay, you know what? The fact that my thermostat can't talk to my security system, can't talk to my smoke detectors because they were all bought on different protocols, it's holding us all back. So they agreed to a unified platform. Now, that said, that was the industry coming up with a solution. And, and part of the reason they did that was because home automation is nowhere near what it could be simply because you have to worry about these things. There's too much, there's, there's too much of a cognitive burden to it. So again, like you know, they got there and it took years. If this had been mandated when home automation was first a thing, I wonder where we'd be right now, probably a lot further ahead. But in general, yeah, I'm agreeing with you The uh, totally that governments play a role in setting the standards, which I know is a very anti-American thing in a lot of ways that free market should dictate. But sometimes you have to set a level, a level playing field for things to work. So that's the kind of like the best case example. Where are countries tripped up on this? Because I mean, we, this is this has actually been going on for a lot longer than most people realize. And I'm sure yeah. by now we've seen things that were well-intentioned that didn't work out the way they should have. You know, what are some examples of that that we can learn from? There are many. Right. I mean, and let's be really clear, like you, you talk about the UK, right, as one of the early adopters of this. If you talk to the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, some of the regulators that were part of the implementation of this, they'll be the first to tell you we didn't get this all correct. Right. And we knew we weren't going to get it all correct. The point of doing this wasn't to say, like, we're only going to do one and done. And then wherever we end up is the final the final stage of this. The point was to be iterative. So they've addressed a lot of what I would think are some of the missteps or, or hurdles that were put in place, but I'll give you a handful, right? So 
first and foremost, a mandate on a particular technology to be used, right? So in the UK, that's the Open Banking Implementation API. That does not work in countries that are more diverse in terms of their market structure. It's great when you've got a very small number of highly concentrated financial institutions and not a ton of fintechs. But the longer you wait to do this, the more fintechs there are. And even if there's still bank concentration, that gets harder for every entity to adopt. So being a little bit more inclusive when it comes to what standards can be used, that's number one. Number two, presuming that stakeholders will all abide by the spirit of the rules and not getting into kind of the expectations. So here's a great example. In Europe, there was this question around, okay, so we, we agree customers, consumers should have a legally binding data right, right? That they, they should have access to all of this data. How do you define what data is in scope of that? And Europe first said, well, whatever data they can get access to today through their native online banking portal. So they go to their bank account, they log in. Just to what's available in the banking portal. <laughs> so wouldn't you know it, a few months later, some of the data starts to disappear from the online banking portal. And coincidence of all coincidences, that data is no longer available through the APIs that these banks are building either. So they had to go back and say, all right, now we need to become much more prescriptive on what data we expect customers are going to have to have access to. So that's on the broader one. Then there are some really like low level technical ones. A big one in, in the UK that's being contemplated right now is the idea of how long should you allow a consumer to give these third parties access for? So originally the UK said it should be 90 days, right? Every 90 days, you should be prompted as a user to say, I still want to use this tool. That is painful. Like if I have to have, like if I'm signed up to like a dozen services for very good reason that I choose to, to have literally something pop up every 90 days, like that's a recipe for failure. Totally. And you said it right, it, it, 90 days for one use case. But let's say you're like most people and you signed up for seven or eight or 10, it's significantly less than 90 days that you're going to be prompted. It's going to be every two weeks or so, right? And then there's this other like element of this, which is not every use case is the same. So for a payment use case where you're actually transacting and moving money, you might want to be prompted more often because there is some risk potentially of somebody getting access to your account and you lose money. But for a use case that is, for example, like a geolocation-based overdraft trigger, right? Like I walk into a mall, let's say, and I get an alert through this app that says, hey, it looks like you're in a mall. You've only got $30 left in your account. If you spend more than $30, you're going to end up paying an overdraft fee. I'm not going to interact with that app very often. I might only interact with it once or twice a year, but I want it to work. And I want it to be logged in and functioning when I am expecting it to work. And the risk of me losing money is significantly lower with that app than it would be on a payment initiation service. So right-sizing the standards for what use case we're talking about is really, really important. And not creating hurdles to the user experience to adoption is really important too. Read. Yeah. I mean, I know I've heard the gripes from England before about like, yeah, you know, it didn't work out the way we thought, but that's the thing about being the first one through the gate, right? You're going to be the test case and everybody else is watching you and that's fine. But in general, I mean, you know, I've even heard some other, specifically in the securities world, some, some other stories have come up that have been interesting on this podcast, including like one where all trading transactions have to be disclosed in, you know, whatever format, it, no, whatever, whatever frequency and, but they didn't dictate the format. So out of bitterness, one of the banks basically loaded it all to a text file every, every day. And it was just like, good luck parsing that data. And it's like, like that's, you know, it, it never, never underestimate a, an institution's ability to be spiteful if it's not in their best interest to be cooperative. Right. So I think that's, again, a, a, this is where legislation matters because, and how it's drafted matters, because if not, people will find ways to, you know, if you don't want to do it, you'll find a way to make life difficult for the person who wants you to do it. I think that's unfortunately correct and not to oversimplify it, but at the heart of it, like this is just the digitization of a process that we've all been doing for many, many decades, right? It, it's the idea of you taking a shoebox filled with receipts and statements to an accountant, to a financial planner, to an insurance, whatever, right? To a lender to get the mortgage, as you were talking about before. But in today's society, there is no need for that to be that time consuming or that labor intensive, right? You should just be able to, in about a 30 second or less, data flow, you should just be able to say, I want this account to have access to this data. And then a dashboard is automatically populated for that account to see in real time, okay, here's what this person made this year, here's what they spent this year, and it saves everybody time and makes it more efficient. Yeah. I mean, this is what I've often said about this situation in Canada. It's that 
we're not really arguing about your right to access the data so much. We're just arguing about the methodology for how you access data. And under legislation currently, we already have the right to it. But now we're basically, I may have access to it, but you're just, you're just being spiteful in the way you're giving it to me, right? So, the, you know, I'm trying to create, and I have, I've said it before on this podcast for countless occasions, is that creating friction is not a way to win over your customers. It's a way to piss them off. And the second a better non-friction alternative cre- is created, the more likely they are to use it. And further to our conversation when we first started, I said, to me, the future of any large bank, if they're smart enough, is to adopt the Copernican revolution of becoming a banking as a service platform as fast as humanly possible to seize that opportunity. But executives aren't rewarded for that kind of innovative thinking in banking, unfortunately, traditionally. So it is what it is. So talk to me about your role as a trade association. So basically, you're going in representing these these fintechs and people in the ecosystem. What is the UK was smart enough to say, Okay, we need to give the other side an equal voice. Surely, I mean, not everybody has been as welcoming or you may have been a unknown factor to many of them. So talk to me about the the different different attitudes you've encountered, both at the initial stages of people really early on in, in the relationship and or the, just the thinking of open banking. And then to for, fast forward to a mature, like we're actually starting to set standards situation. Yeah, great question. So it started very much the way that you described it, right? So first there was, I think, a sense like, oh, that's kind of novel. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about these guys. And sure, I, I suppose it makes sense to use some of these fintech tools. But from a scale perspective, going back five plus years ago, we were nowhere near the rate of adoption that we are now. And when we talked about this as a potential vehicle to increase access and inclusion to financial services and products, I honestly don't think that was taken as seriously, right? Because it might for some, but not at scale. That's You're obviously talking to a group of people who doesn't have access to issues, right? You go talk to politicians. These are not people who are the unbanked, who understand the difficulty that a lot of these people basically have in terms of accessing these, these types of services. But I think the other part of that that you were referring before, you were talking about bank executives. I'll talk about regulators for a second, right? Yeah. Like the culture of a regulator. You are as risk averse as a person can possibly be, right? Because you are not rewarded for taking any kind of innovative step. You are rewarded for things not going wrong, right? And so what is the surest way to make sure nothing goes wrong? You don't take any risk. And so when when you bring in a set of companies or use cases that is not regulated or supervised to the extent that a large national financial institution is, the initial reaction they have is, this is unsafe, right? There is a potential for consumer harm and we need to protect the consumer. And so a lot of our initial conversations in multiple markets were about making regulators more comfortable with a couple of things. One, the, the safeguards that are in place today at these companies. Two, the idea that in an open banking ecosystem, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's not open in the sense that it's just data is flowing uncontrolled, that there is supervision, there is oversight of uh, stakeholders, of third parties. And then third, just to be quite honest, like a lot of the conversations are explaining what I think we think of as fairly straightforward technological terms or ideas to policymakers, elected officials, to regulators who are doing a bunch of other things a lot of the time and are not nearly as steeped in the weeds on this stuff as we are. And so a lot of conversations around data privacy and consumer control of data. But where we are today is, look, I referred to it before, right? You've got the president of the United States calling for this, which is a huge evolution. You've got the Minister of Finance in Canada saying this is a priority. It came up in the election earlier this year as an issue that the two major parties were behind. You've got multiple countries across the globe that are now doing this. And in addition to it being contemplated as a way to lift people up into a better financial state, it's also being thought of more from a macroeconomic perspective as a more competitive stance for countries to take in an increasingly globalized world. So a lot of, for example, in Canada, a lot of the conversations that our group has had with the Department of Finance has been around keeping the Canadian financial services regime competitive against Europe and the UK as they're catapulting ahead on open banking and Canada hasn't. Yeah, well, this is the challenge, right? I mean, this if we're in a, you know, anyone who thinks they can fully restrict access to foreign competitors is sort of mistaken. We're in the world of the internet. We do not live under the great firewall of China. And frankly, all it takes is someone in some jurisdiction that is not going to get punitively punished for doing so to start marketing to citizens within this country. And then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? It enters into, maybe you can do something about it, but it's going to take a lot of time. So there's, there's that challenge. So it's, 
frankly, and let's let's just be honest. I mean, like the reality is, is that the other side of this trend is restriction of data that people generate themselves. Talk about being on the wrong side of a long-term digital trend about enabling the end user as you know within within a competitive kind of a couple markets framework where like if you're if you're a business everything about the modern world and technology is about leading to greater customization and greater you know servicing the you not the mass like this is bang on at the heart of it, at the heart of the open data play, which is the bigger play in the long run. And if you're on the wrong side of that, you're on the wrong side of history in a lot of ways. And if you're a country on the wrong side of that, the reality is sooner or later, like you're going to, let's just imagine that we didn't do anything about it in a country for 10 years and then suddenly open the floodgates. You can't compete internationally anymore. In fact, you're going to be, you're going to fall prey to international predators very quickly. So it has to be done, even if you want to protect your own banking ecosystem. Yeah, I have two thoughts that come to mind. One is just to, it reminded me of an extreme version of some of the data restrictions that we've seen. So there are some financial institutions in some countries that are now saying, you, the consumer, you cannot make available to third parties any data around the fees that we charge you because that's proprietary. And what does that do? Of course, it's I pay you. is proprietary. Are you kidding me? That's insane. It stops you from comparing, right? So like I, in, in a perfect open banking environment, you could, let's stick with your credit card example from before. Yeah. You could ask one credit card provider to look at your existing credit card transactions for the last year. And it could tell you, if you used us last year, here's how much more or less you would have paid in interest and fees, right? You can't do that if fees are not allowed as being you know, made accessible to third parties. The fee comparison tool is huge in the security space, in the credit space. It's the most basic fundamental element of a free market, the ability to have the information you need to make an informed choice. But the other point that I was thinking of, Jason, as you were just chatting before, is a lot of the pushback that we're having in some markets is, well, if we do open banking, big tech is going to come in and nobody wants Facebook bank or Google insurance, right? They and will decide look, if they want Facebook bank and Google insurance. Thank you very much. But that's the point. And look, look, Facebook and Google are not members, right? We don't have any of those companies as, as FData members. But the, the point from our view is have a level playing field. Set the requirements for what the regulatory expectations are for any non-bank technology provider in open banking. And if Facebook or Google or Apple or any company abide by those rules and consumers or SMEs decide to use those companies provided that they're getting the right consent and disclosures and right protections, then sure, there should be that ability to choose in the marketplace. But further than that, who the hell are they to tell us that, that at the end of the day, nobody wants that? You know what? If they come out with it and people don't adopt it, that is people voting with their wallets. To assume that because you're an incumbent, that people have voted with their wallets, that they want you to be permanently in charge is, I mean, on, like, oh, there's such a negative. There's no positive connotation to that level of hubris. The reality is, is that that is a monopolist. No, that is, a, that is a rent-seeking behavior is to think that, well, we know what's best for you. Like, nonsense, nonsense. If anything, governments should be hearing that argument and saying, oh, really? Well, let's find out. Yeah, that's right. And I suppose the obvious response to that is, if you don't think that people need it, then why not make the data available, right? Yeah, I mean, and this is you know this is an argument coming, and, and just to be clear, in my position, I don't think there's a worse company in the world than Google. Sorry, not Google. Sorry, than Facebook in terms of like how poorly they've treated our privacy. So I'm not exactly eager to hand over anything to them, but at the same time, I still respect the fact that they should be given granted the same opportunities anyone else. That's besides the point. So I'm glad we took the time to chat about this, and this is going <laughs> this is going along for a good reason. Open banking conversations typically do, but before we wrap up, there's three questions. I ask everyone that I want to ask you, sure. Stephen. Sure, we get them in. The first one is if you had one wish for something can change in your organization or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Legally binding data right becoming the law of the land in all major developed countries. I take a sigh of relief because it's just like, how is that not a thing? How is something that I create that I have access to not mine? And I think Italy's enshrined that in the law. I believe that it's it's like literally, you know, any data you create is yours as it should be. And, and you know, think about the opposite position of that. There's entire multinational, massive corporations like Google and Facebook who are built off monetizing our data, yet somehow we don't have that ability. That is nonsense. Second question I have for you. What's been the biggest challenge that you've encountered thus far in getting updated to where it is today? So yeah, I mean, look, we work with small companies, right? And the number one obstacle we face is small companies saying, I'm trying to build something. Why should I take my time and resources and devote it to talking to regulators or policymakers? 
that's not going to necessarily help me get more adoption or grow my user base. But at the end of the day, I think that seeing where the obstacles are and the only way this is going to get better is getting government to move. I think that's what's gotten more and more companies to get into this pool with us. That's an interesting view because I can understand how early on they would have that stance. But at a certain, at a certain point in their own development, they will hit a wall where they cannot go further without it. So it, it, I get where they're coming from. But it's very short-sighted not to simply embrace you with both arms and say, please, let's do this together. Going to start bringing you with me on these calls, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I advise multiple companies, and half the time my job is to simply say, you need to wake up. <laughs> anyway, last question for you is, what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and keeps you getting up every morning to keep on fighting the good fight? And in your case, I will definitively refer to it as a good fight because it totally Thank you. Is. So the potential, if this all goes the right way. You're talking about the potential for a real, true 21st century financial services system that is global. It's not country specific. It is open to everybody. It is competitive. It does not favor incumbents over non-incumbents or vice versa. It puts the consumer in full control. If that doesn't excite you as somebody who works in financial services or policy, then I don't know what will. Yeah. And you know what? This is an interesting day because I had to go reopen a bank account for my one of my holding companies that got shut down without me realizing it today. And while I was sitting there going through all the pain of getting this thing reopened, I literally tweeted out, Someone remind me, it's been a while since I read Dante, but what circle of hell is opening up a <laughs> corporate account in, in Canadian banking system? I can't really, it was just like, that's like, I'm sitting there going, how is this so goddamn painful in this day and age? And it is the case. So maybe if people felt the pain a little bit more every day, they'd be a little bit more open to it. But I keep saying it, this is, there's no greater financial empowerment issue in the world today than the concept of open banking, because it will hit every demographic every level of wealth, everything imaginable, and it has the limitless potential for the betterment of society. So thank you for what it is you do. I wish you nothing but success and whatever I can do to support it. <laughs> I know. appreciate it, Jason. So, Thanks for the time too. Good talk. My pleasure, Steve. So that was today's interview with Steve Roms of the Financial Data and Technology Association, or FData. And uh, as you've heard many times on this podcast, I'm a big supporter of the concept, and I hope I've converted you to it as well. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, or whatever to get your podcast. And until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at Jason Pereira.